Good morning. It's so beautiful looking out with a sea of twinkling lights. It's just perfect. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Olivia, as Sarah introduced me this morning. And it's such a privilege this morning to be able to share with you on Mother's Day. It's so, as a mum, it's beautiful. I welcome all the mums in the room this morning and my mum there in the bright bubblegum pink. <laughs> there is no missing her this morning. Um, so welcome, mum. Thank you for coming this morning. Happy Mother's Day to you. Um, I'd like to say thank you to our pastors and our elders for allowing me to share my insights um, and experiences with you today on a topic that I believe is so vitally important for us as a church, if, if we're not just to gather in rows, but to gather in circles. So you would have heard that already through this series. Um, and we've had some really powerful reminders in this series so far about how we can contribute to our life as a community in our church. So last week, Pastor Avi um, guided us through the acronym. If you see, this, this, this will test you, SHAPE, if you could remember. I couldn't remember. Even when I got home, started to prep for this week, I was like, oh, yeah, no, that's right. And then it all came back to me. So it was S for spiritual gifts, H for heart, a for abilities, P for personality, and E for experience. And she shared the importance of not comparing ourselves to others and to be part of the body that we're called to in order to serve each other. And that was a challenge right in that moment because as she was sharing that and I was watching her stance and you know, watching you walk across the stage and she's animated and she's not relying on her notes and she's got her headpiece in, I'm thinking, oh, that's gonna be me next week. I don't think I can wear one of those things. I'm not quite sure how much I can command the stage without my notes. Um, but anyway, I'm me, and I'm giving you my um, bit today, hoping not to be too much in comparison. Um, so one of the ways we're called to contribute to each other is to care for one another. So that, that whole concept of caring for one another, I'm really delighted to be able to share that part of the series with you today. So... Um, hence the message is titled, Care for One Another. So I wonder what comes to mind to you, for, for you, when you hear that phrase, caring for one another. So in preparation for today, I thought, I wonder what our congregation think about that message and about those words. So I put a little call out to a few connections and said, can you give me some insights as to what you believe that looks like in what that means to you. So here's some responses. I haven't put names to these responses, but you'll know who you are if you sent me this message back. So thank you for contributing. So one of them, somebody said, it's partaking in a loving relationship. Someone else said, it's to take time to listen to people and to show them that you're willing to walk with them and help where you can if necessary. Someone else said, this means to me looking out for others, getting to know them better, listening to what they have to say, helping physically and spiritually, to encourage them, people of all ages, especially in the family of believers. And then someone else shared, knowing that others have your best interests at heart, seeing a need and doing something about it, Caring for others can look different depending on our need. So it was, it was insightful just to hear from some, some responses initially to that first phrase. So what do we mean by this word care? In our community, there are many places, I was thinking about this through the week, where do we see or where do we read or where do we, um, you know, where do we experience care? So there's just a couple on the screen there, but we've got aged care, we've got day care, we've got after school care, care groups at church, foster care, respite care, in home care, and care for the homeless. And I'm sure there's many more where we see that word 
in our community, separate from church, where we seek care. And perhaps you've worked in any of these settings or been, or been on the receiver of some of that care too. Because there's all of those different... Um, this is the teacher in me, always likes a good Oxford Dictionary definition. My English class curls their toes when I give them a new word or a vocab and I say, right, everyone, look it up, find the definition. Um, but care is important to define it. And according to the Oxford Dictionary, it says it's the process of caring for somebody or something and providing what they need for their health or protection. And that's the, the, that definition. So I wonder if you can just think for a moment of a time when you've ever felt that to be cared for. What does that feel like to you? Perhaps you've had to receive an emergency experience of care, maybe from the ambulance or the fire or the police. Have you had to call on them for help? Or maybe you've been to hospital or you've had to help someone else get to hospital to receive care for something. I'm sure at some point in our, our lives and our experiences, we've, had to, we've experienced that. So I can I share a little bit of a story. Um, when I first had our eldest boy, Alessandro, mum and dad hadn't been in the country very long. They were living with us till they found their, their first home. And he was days old, the baby. Um, new mummy, trying to get to head, you know, head round how to care for this little baby. And um, I was trying to navigate the sleep and the feeds and the timings of everything and someone who just loves their sleep and wasn't coping at all <laughs> with the fact that there was no... The nurses said to me, there's no night, there's no day, it's just kind of all one, you just sleep when you can. Couldn't get my head around that at all, it was just terrible. Um, but one particular night when I did go to bed and get some sleep, I woke in excruciating pain. And... Um, I, re I recall Tony, you know, what on earth is happening? We've just been through labour, what's this? Um, and my focus was so much on the care of Alessandro that as much as I was crying in pain for my own thing that was going on, um, my focus was still on him. And it was the care of mum and dad and Tony that said, something's not quite right, I think we need to call in ambulance. Um, again, I was a little bit, you know, stubborn, stubborn Andaloros, aren't we? And um, I was like, no, I'll be fine, I'll be fine, let me just get through the night. But I needed to go. So I suppose from there, then the care then took over by the medical team who were the ambos that came and then looked after me in the ambulance, got to hospital, medical team then took over. Um, and also, it was a bit of a mystery thing. I think it, in the end, it was just those afterbirth something or others. Anyway, I'm not very technical with what it was specifically, and it wasn't a, a big, serious thing. But once I got there and, and received that level of immediate care, um, I was just obviously naturally so grateful. And my mind went back home to the newborn, of course. And then mum and dad's care was there. Fortunately, the timing of all of that was perfect because they could just kind of step in, look after him. So that display of care will never be forgotten in my early journey as being a new mum. So care can come in different sizes and different shapes. But when we have been on the receiving end of care, something remarkable does happen to us, I think. I feel like we do get changed. Um, and there are some benefits and some barriers, I suppose, if you like, to, to care, to receiving care and giving care. And I'd just like to take a moment this morning just to highlight some benefits. So there's, kind of th there's, there's more than three, but I'm just going to highlight three benefits of, of receiving care, and then we'll look at what potential barriers there might be to, the, to, to receiving care. So the first one is belonging. When we care for one another, it promotes this sense of connection and belonging. And it can lead to this increase in emotional well-being for the person who's receiving that care and for the person providing it. Caring actions, those feelings of empathy and compassion and support, they help reduce uh, um, those feelings of loneliness and stress and anxiety. 
So that's the first one, that, sense, that feeling of belonging. The second one is about strength in relationships. So caring for one another fosters such a strong, strong relationships and bonds between those that you care for. Showing that kindness, showing that understanding, showing the support. We can build trust and therefore build that deeper connection with others. Um, and in turn, that then leads to that kind of fulfilling and meaningful relationships, both personally and professionally, depending on what capacity or what space you're in. Um, so building of those relationships and strengthening those. Um, and then the other one, just around your improved overall health. So care and support for each other can have a real positive impact on our physical health. And Pastor Rob mentioned in his first week about some studies that took place um, uh, showing the social support and caring relationships can actually risk, uh, not risk, actually reduce the risk of chronic diseases, like boost your immune system, and contribute to a longer and healthier life, which is pretty remarkable, right? So when we care for each other, it creates this environment that therefore promotes the, this well-being and reduces that negative effect of stress overall. So there's, there's just a snapshot of some of the benefits. And then we look at some of the barriers then, because it's well and good having um, to be receiving, and sometimes even receiving care can be, you know, not, not everybody likes to ask for help, number one. Some people feel a little, can feel a little bit like, oh, I've got this, or um, I, it's okay, thanks for offering, but I don't quite know how to receive that. Um, and sometimes we might have some great intentions on giving care, but one of our barriers might be our lack of time. It's, there's so much, I, th I remember a few weeks ago when I was talking to you about being present and that we have demand on our time. And it can be a really significant barrier, therefore, for caring for people, because where am I going to fit that in? You know, I've got so many commitments, so many responsibilities. If I then have to stop and care for this person or think about that person, how, how are we going to fit that in? It might be, you know, I'm busy trying to cook a meal for my own family. Oh, yeah, I should really make one for Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so who's down the street and da-da-da. But that's just another layer and that's just another bit of time I have to give and maybe that hinders us in some capacity. But know this, Jesus always had time for people, didn't he? He was a busy man. He had lots going on. But he had the time. He made the time. Another one might be some cultural and social barriers. You know, it's different beliefs and norms, just, you know, and cultural norms, beliefs, social structures. All of those things can be, sometimes be a barrier to our care. Um, even asking for help might be a sign of vulnerability, like I said before. Some people just don't know, perceive it as a sign of weakness to ask for that. Um, if it's a particular culture you're not so familiar with, it might be as simple as I don't quite know what to make them. If it's, you know, can they have this? Can they have that? How is that, that taken? Um, you know, even in the church, there could be a perception by some of us that, you know, that's, that's not my job. That's the pastor's job or the associate pastor's job or the other person's job. They, they, they do that better. They're a pastor. That's their job. They can go care for the sheep. Hmm, just a thought. Isn't that what we pay Pastor Rob for? <laughs> to come and care for us? <laughs> no. But sometimes it can be that perception, oh, it's not my role, it's not my job. And then a, a, another barrier potentially is the lack of resources. So it could be that we're stopped there because I can't financially afford to stop and support that. So I'm not going to invest in that. Or it could be a healthcare service that's limiting, or a social support system that's limiting, and that becomes the barrier for providing that care. So without adequate resources, people might struggle 
to meet their own individual needs, thinking, well, I just can't do that for someone else. But this is what church is about. Church, I believe, we're better together caring for one another. So we can be, do that in a variety of ways, I believe. And I suppose the next segue into what I want to share with you at Lifeway, well, who is responsible? Who is responsible? So as a, as a church family, life together in rows is great. Right? We're all here in our rows, but circles are better. May I just... Ah, oh, beautiful. Thank you. At the back. <laughs> um, so Pastor Rob allowed us to see the importance of how being in community with each other gives us a chance to notice what we each need and what care we need. We can't always see that in rows on a Sunday morning. It's not always that easy. So it kind of leads us to, well, as a church, we have pastoral care. I've, I, in, uh, this is not on the script, by the way. I just felt to share it with you. So at school, we, I have a homeroom, and in that time in the morning, that's our pastoral care time. And they laughed at me when I first started because I called it pastoral care. And they said to me, what's pastoral care? I said, that's, you know, when you give care to each other in your little room. They said, no, that's pastoral care, miss. I was like, well, my, my, my British accent might say different, but I've since converted to pastoral care. I think that's the right expression of the word. Um, but that pastoral care, you know, pastoring of other, um, doesn't just happen from our pastors in our, in our, in our system. So... You know, it can be delivered formally, it can be de delivered informally, but it's our responsibility of all of us. So at Lifeway, it can look, it can look, how can that look? So during the COVID pandemic, um, there was a model, our care circle model, that's when that was introduced to Lifeway, to us here. And it was just an opportunity to care for one another on a whole other level. level. And during this time, um, those people who weren't part of a life group and had no way of following, necessarily being followed up, were able to meet in, and couldn't meet in person due to the restrictions that were happening. A care circle had a leader or two, maybe. And then there were some extras that also came into those circles, which were wonderful. And... It was just an opportunity then, and still, still running to now, where we're not required to necessarily catch up in any activities back then, but we did meet through Zoom catch-ups. We did get a chance to see each other and connect still and care for one another in that capacity. Um, and then once restrictions were eased, that care circle model then opened up and then to this day, we're still meeting for lunches and play dates, and it's just fabulous. Um, and it really does bring blessing to those people who are involved in a care circle. Um, I remember this time, you know, this is a time in history that it will, we will never forget very quickly, I don't think, this whole pandemic time. And I remember a time, I recall very, very clearly, I was at home particularly sad and lonely this particular day. And I was trying to navigate life. I had a newborn. I had a kinder. Uh, Christiana was at kinder. And Alessandro had just begun prep. And I'm there trying to navigate the whole Google Online thing. I had a newborn, trying to time the feeds. It was, you know, quite intense, as it would have been for lots of us at home. Um, and at that same day, I was thinking, oh, I just don't feel cared for. I'm doing this all by myself, and this is a real battle, and this is a real struggle. And you know, God's timing every time just blows me away. Because guess what arrived on my doorstep that day? Cue photo. This care package arrived from Lifeway. And I was so stoked. I was, I was just so happy that this arrived that day. There was, that, there was a photograph up there with um, people who were 
connecting to each other. We had some masks, we had some chocolate, we had a voucher for the teapot, the little teapot cafe when we could go back there. Yeah, it was all sorts happening. I'm not sure the wipes were in the package. They were just my prop for taking the photo. Um, but yes, I was hand sanitizer, chocolate. Oh my goodness me. And that care package arrived. And I was like, oh God, you're amazing. Right there, just as I was having my whinge, this package arrived and it just made my day, as it would have done for those people who received those. And I thank you, whoever you were, I, I'm still not 100% clear who were the collaborators and the makers of those, but I thank you. And I thank you that you sent them out to those other people who received them. It was very kind and very thoughtful and very needed, particularly on that day. Um, so yeah, it's a care package through our church. Now you're thinking, well, where's all this? This is a, a sermon, right? I haven't heard much scripture happening. Well, this is the, the, the save this next bit here. We're going to launch into what God's saying now. So um, for the time remain remaining that I'm standing here talking to you, I'm going to share one of my favorite stories, actually, in the Bible. Um, and it's a beautiful display of how care is given, I believe. It's, about, it's found in Luke 5, 17 to 26, and it involves the story of a paralyzed man and his friends, and um, how his friends in this story take time to bring this paralyzed man to, Je to Jesus, and they find a way. So we're just going to watch a quick clip now, just to break things up a little bit, and then I'll talk you through some of this. So remarkable, incredible miracle that took place. And I'd like to focus on his friends in that particular scripture, in the, and what that image that you saw there. You know, this man lived his life on his mat, three feet wide, three feet long, no, three feet wide and six feet long, um, and he relied on people around him to care for him. They had to feed him, they had to carry him, they had to clothe him, they had to move him. His body held him a prisoner. There was no surgeries to rectify what was going on for him, no specific medicines, no rehab centres back then. The story... That story, I believe, couldn't have taken place without his friends. It can be difficult on a Sunday for us to go deep into this deep connection with each other. But our true Christianity and commu Christian community requires us to be intentional with how we gather and how we support each other. In this story of the paralyzed man, his friends befriended him despite his disability, despite the fact that he was an inconvenience, despite the fact maybe he was a financial pressure, despite the fact that he cost them time, despite the fact that he cost them energy, they still take, took time to care for him. Is the pace of your life limiting you perhaps? from assigning top priority to relationships that you need to invest in. We can devote lots of time to different things, making money, sorting our businesses out, running our errands, playing sport. But are we been neglecting something or someone? Taking time. Community can't be done in a hurry. It just can't. Relationships can't be formed and maintained in a hurry. Everybody's normal until you get to know them, according to, in this book um, that Rob put me onto. This author, John Ortberg, his book's called Everybody Normal. Everybody's normal till you get to know them. And he states, if you think you can fit deep into the cracks of an overloaded schedule, think again. Wise people do not microwave friendship, parenting, or marriage. It takes time. So what the friends did for the paralyzed man was to care enough to see him and see that he came with something, a mat. He came with his mat, and every one of us comes with a mat. 
We all have one. Not maybe in the same way as this man, but we all do have one. The mat stands as a picture of human brokenness and imperfection. Everyone has a mat. Maybe your mat's your temper. Maybe you can't control your temper. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's your need to trust people. Maybe it's your need to control people. It could involve a really terrible secret you're holding on to that nobody knows. Maybe you're guilty about something. Maybe it's inadequacy. Maybe your mat's loneliness. It could be an addiction. It could be an eating disorder. It could be anything, but we all have one. Maybe you're here today and you pretend to everyone you don't have one. Well, I don't have a mat. I've got it all sorted. Mm. <laughs> you appear to other people, I've got this, I'm strong, don't need anyone to care for me, I can do this all by myself. I've got it sorted. I'm, I'm not going to reveal my mat to you. Maybe that's you. But everyone has one. It is when we allow other people to see our mat, when we give and receive help and care for one another, that, in that space, like the paralysed man, is when the healing can then come. So this man must have wrestled with his great need to be dependent upon other people. And it must have struggled, he must have struggled in how they saw him in his neediness. If you take a moment just to think that through. Again, um, John Ortberg writes, it's a very vulnerable thing to have someone carry your mat. When somebody's carrying your mat, they see you and they see your weakness. And what if they drop you? and hurt you in that moment when you're needing something. So time for a story. I can't promise I won't cry through this one, so please be gracious with me if I do. (laughs) But it's a beautiful story of a friendship that I do have. So a few years ago, I met someone in our church who was pregnant at the same time as me. And we began this beautiful journey of pregnancy, you know, week by week, showing our bumps and encouraging each other. We prayed for each other. We talked about, you know, although this was her first baby, my third baby, it was all the baby items we were going to gather and do all, do all those new things, exciting things together. We moaned about our aches and pains. And um, uh, remarkably, we birthed both our baby boys within days of each other, which was really special too. And we look forward to our friends, our boys growing up together. So sorry, I knew I would do this, so be gracious. Um, And it wasn't long after having our newborns that this dear friend of mine got some news that was really hard for her, incredibly hard for her because she found out her husband had been having an affair. So um, that was difficult, very difficult. And she was trying to reconcile and establish and work that out. And and she then had to deal with knowing that life would look different and she was going to be a single mummy. So that was hard. But in that painful time, She let me see her brokenness. She was totally vulnerable with me. She let me pray with her. She let me care for her. She let me carry her, her mat in that time. And if you want a deep friendship and you want a deep relationship with somebody, you cannot always be that strong one. There has to be moments you need to let someone else carry your mat because everyone has a mat. So in this story in Luke, his friends were so determined, so determined to get him to see Jesus. Not for their gain, it wasn't for their personal gain, but for the benefit of their friend. They realised it was an unorthodox way to enter a crowded room. You know, they were desperate to get to Jesus. They decided to become roof crashers 
back then. They were like, right. So great was their love for their friend that they decided they would not let anything get in their way. These men were devoted friends. They served him and they decided, right, we're going to do this. We're going to crash in on the roof and get our friend to Jesus because they knew their faith was so strong that he would be able to, to heal him and their faith for, it was there through their faith that that happened. So how often do you do a little bit of roof crashing? How often? It no, it most of the time involves two actions. Noticing and then doing. When you see someone who's discouraged, do you give them a call? Do you give them a text? Do you drop a note in their letterbox? Do you take that time to listen when your, your schedule is so busy and full? Perhaps it's dropping in a gift to somebody just because, not because it's a birthday or it's Mother's Day or it's an anything other day. It's just because you know that that would bless that person. You drop a meal off to somebody unexpected just because. Just because. No reason at all. Just because. In great communities, people carry mats and crash through roofs without asking a question, what is in it for me? It's not about us in that moment. You know, last, that, that happened with my dear friend a few years ago. And then last year, and at moments this year, that same friend is now carrying, helping me carry my, you know, my mat. You know, when she was broken after her marriage ended, I went through a season where I too was broken. My circumstances were very different, but I had a mat too. And I was walking through some stuff where I was really fearful about things that were happening in and around me. Yet she, she picked up uh, every time I rang, every time I text, every time I cried for help, she was there. She offered her home and said, come, just come here for a quiet space and breathe. She came to my house and had my three kids so I could just go for a walk and get some air. She booked lunch, took lunch so that she could pay for me in, at, at moments maybe when that particular week was financially really tight and she just blessed me and said, please let me just do this for you. And so it's been a privilege to journey alongside each other because she's helped, I helped her, she's helped me, and we'll continue that between us. You know, John Orberg writes, but for better or worse, we're shaped more by people than any other force in life. And in the same way, more than anything else, God uses people to heal people. The friends who took the paralyzed man to Jesus had the faith that he would be healed. That's what great friends do for each other. The scripture says, when Jesus saw their faith, it was the friend's faith, not primarily the man's faith that healed him in that instance. So just as I conclude the message today, have a think about whose faith has had a deep impact on your life. Who do you share your mat with? And whose do you carry? Because everybody has a mat. Let's pray. Jesus, I just thank you for this morning and I thank you for the opportunity to share your word and for what you wanted to share to your people this morning. We thank you for those who care. We thank you for those who are in need. And we thank you that you've equipped us to do such a thing as have the faith and to help to carry each other's mats. I pray, Lord Jesus, this week as we go back out, that you'd reveal to us who's that person that I can care for? Who will I help to carry alongside this week? 
If you think you don't have a mat, you do. Everyone has a mat. I just pray you have the courage to maybe share with those who you trust and can confide in what that is so they can help you. Thank you for this beautiful day. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.